Uh, if you did not attend yesterday, we had uh, a thousand people on yesterday's webinar uh, and, with John Raich. And, um, you know, it's, it's clear that folks are looking for a, a blend of inspiration, of, uh, of uh, sort of we can do it, overcoming challenges, as well as a lot of practical information. And we're in for a treat today because we're going to get a do he healthy dose of both. Uh, let me just say first um, that we have a, quite a few new uh, participants each time we do this. So I, I do want to once again uh, thank New Hope Network, uh, the Genuzzi Group, Bank of America, and Whipstitch Capital for helping us to put on these uh, webinars, as well as uh, the Institute itself, uh, which I remind you is May 7th and 8th. And although I'll get back to the Institute at the end of this, let me just quickly say, and Shazi has participated in our Institute, uh, she, she knows it well. Um, this, these are the last days right now for submitting cases. We actually have quite a lot of cases. We have about 200 people now signed up for May 7th and 8th. Uh, but if you have a burning uh, finance question, uh, how do I raise capital at this time? What kind of capital should I be raising? Uh, what about involving my suppliers? Uh, uh, should I be talking to angels? Should I not be raising capital, cash flow forecasting, or branding and positioning in this really rapidly changing uh, marketplace right now? We have an incredible array of panelists and speakers uh, available uh, on May 7th. So uh, please get your case in. Uh, we will be sorting those out this week because, frankly, we want to leave enough time for those of you who are selling consumer products to get them sent off to the panelists in advance. So we really need to uh, make short work of it. So if you have a case uh, and you'd like to submit it, uh, please do so. It's Go to HirschbergInstitute.com. It's a super simple uh, act. Similarly, the next day, Friday the 8th, will be an all day of pitching. 14 of you will have the opportunity to pitch to now over 37 investors who've signed on, ranging from angels to institutions. And if you are looking to raise capital, uh, this is a good time to do it. But again, we must have your pitch this week. So thanks for that. Um, you know, as I've said before, uh, our purpose at the Hirschberg Entrepreneurship Institute and with these webinars is to help your business grow, uh, help it succeed. And of course, right now, uh, particularly the 2% of you who we just saw who are still very worried, I don't want to, you may be in the minority, but I don't want to ignore you. It's really to try to lend a hand, any hand we can, to help you uh, get through this. And again, uh, I can't think of a better uh, a person to help present this than, than, than Shazi. Um, next week, uh, we do have two more cases. Andrew Abraham will join us on Tuesday. And on Thursday, uh, we will have Drake Sadler from Traditional Medicinals. Uh, so we got a kind of a new gen entrepreneur and a another old guy like me. Uh, and, uh, but I do want to also draw your attention before we go to Shazi to uh, on April 29th, uh, uh, two weeks from yesterday, uh, we will have a, another, uh, I think, really important opportunity for you to talk to your customers, specifically the president of Infra, Independent Natural Food Retailers, and the head of purchasing uh, for um, NCG, for the co-ops. Uh, national uh, co-op grocers, and then, of course, Kehi, the distributor. We will do a, a moderated panel with Bob Burke that day for, at 5 p.m. that Wednesday. So uh, if it's anything like yesterday, I would sign up and I would get on early because uh, uh, we only have a 1,000 uh, places, actually, at any given time. So let me turn to Shazi now and say welcome. And uh, let me just say a word to all of you. I think by now most of you know uh, this uh, amazing woman. Um, I, 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 what you don't necessarily know if you uh, haven't spent time with her personally is she is the definition of, of tenacity. Uh, she, even in how we met, Shazi set her targets on me. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know when that was uh, and just simply wasn't going to take no. And uh, you know, the foot in the door, well, her whole body was in the door and I just surrendered long ago and I'm glad I did. I've been proud to be uh, a partner, a colleague, an investor, a mentor. I've steered her right most of the time, not all the time. Uh, and maybe you'll get into that, Shanti, but um, nonetheless. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this positive, so I, I okay. will not. All right, good, good. Uh, but I will say, uh, besides uh, bringing her extraordinary uh, experience and track record and overcoming challenges as a 
uh, an entrepreneur with Happy Family uh, as a mom. Uh, and by the way, doing those two at the same time. Uh, she's now launching, as you'll hear in a moment, a, a new and spectacular company with her husband, Joe. So without further ado, Shazi Bistram, welcome. Hey, Gary, it's so nice to be here with you guys. And Ethan, I love that you're passing the torch to Ethan. Um, oh, he I, am, I am very, very happy to share uh, during this time. And frankly, I think we all need um, a little bit of brightness and a little bit of optimism and a little bit of a reminder that these times that we're challenged are the ones that oftentimes stay with us and oftentimes create better versions of ourselves um, because we're forced to. Um, and I thought um, as a way to kind of kick off today, I would talk about three things. Um, I would share a little bit of what it's really like to be in the trenches when there's so much uncertainty and anxiety and um, a lack of resources and share a story from the happy days. I thought I would share a personal story um, that may resonate with some of you and then talk about what I'm working on next and why during this time of uncertainty and challenge, uh, we have decided to move boldly forward um, with this vision because there is just this mission within me that forces me to do it. And sometimes there's no time, no time like um, the current time. And in, in my case, that is, that is what's happening. So um, if that's cool, we'll kick off. I have a few slides prepared so that we could have something visual to look at. And to give everyone some context, um, I launched a company called Happy Baby. Um, in 2006, and it took me about three years to launch. Um, during that three-year time, I did accost Gary in a parking lot at Babson after an entrepreneur institute that he was um, uh, was the keynote speaker, and it was very cold. I drove from New York um, to the Boston area in a Honda Accord in January without heat, and um, Gary literally was like, boom, like, like literally like what you would do maybe if you don't care about an insect. Um, and then, but he is true. I did stick with him because, um, because look at him, he's so special. And who doesn't want um, his support and energy towards helping you realize your dreams. And sometimes it just is a good lesson because you have to figure out how to actually properly pitch your dream to get the attention that you need. Um, so, I'm going to just jump into kind of a little bit of the story of Happy. For those of you who might not know Happy Family, Happy Family Organics is now the largest organic baby food brand in the country. Um, we are the second largest baby brand in the country, only next to Gerber, which is owned by Nestle. And I promise you within 10 or 15 years, I believe that will change um, if I have anything to do with it, which I might not, <laughs> but I hope so. Um, and when we first launched Happy, my dream, and the reason actually I accosted Gary is I wanted to sell baby food next to the Yo Baby yogurt in the, in the dairy case. And I thought that if we could have a partnership that would help solidify uh, parents' trust in a brand new brand, um, trying to do something very different. And my whole dream was that if I could somehow address children's nutrition from the very first bite, we could possibly create this almost like an architecture for health um, that started with the appreciation and the acceptance of real fresh whole food. And um, many, of you, many of you might or might not remember, but there was an era that in baby food, the entire category was just jars. And um, the way you make a jar, and it's, it has improved, which is great, um, but typically jars had been, there were Pretty processed food because it has a three-year shelf life and so a lot of times you might say it might say peas and water but what that meant was these were peas that were um, grown 10 years ago um, harvested turned into a freeze-dried pea powder sitting in a drum in a warehouse and then you know um, reconstituted with water at a high temperature in a jar with a retort um, to live on the shelf for three years which could be you know, much longer than your child had been in the world. And I thought, well, I've got it. I'm gonna change the entire world because we're gonna start them out on healthy organic baby food that's sustainably harvested and grown, and this is it. 
And so I worked for two and a half years. Um, I want to also give you guys some context. I don't have any rich uncles or any rich family members. I'm the wealthiest person in my family now, um, <laughs> which is nice, I guess. But um, I grew up in a motel room in Alabama, uh, a town called Fultondale, Alabama. My parents had a day's in. And um, we lived in room 123 and 125. Um, so I know you're thinking, oh, she's so beautiful and sophisticated and, um, and so wealthy. But let me tell you that I've earned my stripes. And um, when I was r raising the money for Happy, I, um, I didn't have a rich uncle. So we took checks as small as $2,500. And I believe it was your more recent guest, Seth Goldman. He, he gave me a whopping $2,500 check, um, which was always, which I, I always kind of rib him for now. But um, it was meaningful. And he wanted to do $5,000, but uh, it ended up being $2,500. So, um, and you know what? You take what you can get. Anyway, so. We launch, takes me two years to launch because you can't launch baby food out of your, your kitchen. Um, it, it's just, you, you require, I wanted a HACCP plan. I wanted it to feel credentialed. I wanted the right doctors involved. Um, so we launch and what you're seeing was our first packaging and you see these ice cubes that are beautifully shot. Um, and those are little frozen cubes of the equivalent of, of homemade baby food. And you know, I put everything I had into this business and um, I started doing demos, which many of us have done. And standing in the demo aisle, um, trying to get a mom with a baby to walk by and try some baby food that was alive and fresh and so organic and just, you know, um, attractive. And immediately I'm like, wow, nobody's stopping. Nobody wants to try it. In fact, they would kind of wrinkle their nose and say like, gross, I don't want to try baby food. And, um, you know, for me, I had raised $550,000. I'd been working on this business plan for almost two years. And I did like two weeks of demos. And I had to say, you know what? Um, I made some wrong assumptions. And I learned a really, really big lesson that day. And that is that if you want to um, innovate and bring something new to market, you have to meet the needs of the consumers where they are. And even though I set out to create the alternative to the jar of baby food, and we had this beautiful product that I was actually very proud of that my son ate, um, we, it wasn't gonna happen there because what this is, is the alternative to homemade baby food. And so we pivoted. And next thing you know, I'm adding probiotics to baby's first food, which was cereal. Um, and I'm thinking, how can we create enlightened versions of products that are already selling well in mass and start making a name for ourselves so that when we get to the place where we find the alternative to the jar, we'll be ready. And um, I guess just, you know, long story short, it took about four years of innovating. We launched um, this beautiful Happy Belly cereal. We launched Puffs. We launched Yogi's with Stonyfield yogurt, which are little freeze dried um, yogurt snacks. And then one day I saw a pouch in Melbourne, Australia at a, um, at a food show um, of someone selling applesauce in a pouch. And I knew that was the alternative to the jar. But it took us four years of struggling, not being able to pay the bills, um, putting you know, payroll on credit cards, um, and keeping the baby food, the frozen baby food alive, and innovating in the dry set to start building a name for ourselves in the dry set to get to a place where we had a pouch. So we went from 116,000 in sales um, that first year in 2006 to 520,000 when we added in the cereals um, to 2.1 million when we added in the puffs um, and the yogis. And then uh, we launched the pouches and then it was 13.3 million and then 40. And then it's basically like that, um, you know, dreamy rock, uh, dreamy um, uh, hockey stick that we all, we all as entrepreneurs um, kind of hope for. But it took many years to get there. And I guess the lesson that I had um, learned from that is that regardless of what you think is going to be the way forward, if you're driven by a purity of purpose, which was to really improve children's health and to take toxins out of their bodies and their soils by creating, in the soil by creating a brand that could really move people, 
um, stay, stay true to the mission, but be re ready to adapt on the, on the way. And um, I think that, you know, the ability to adapt and the ability to adapt to a new normal is something that creates character in all of us um, that, again, lasts a lifetime and also bleeds into our personal lives. And so I'm going to totally shift gears now and tell you guys a story um, about my personal life. Um, so that's my little guy, Zane. Um, he was born January 31st, 2010. He's probably the most beautiful human being I've ever seen. Um, Joe and I, my husband and I, celebrated him every moment uh, those first few years where we would even look at ourselves and say like, oh my God, we have this like baby genius and he's so connected and he's so, um, he's so everything. And his name means gift from God, actually. And um, it all, in Arabic, it also means a beautiful one. And um, I've learned that naming my children can be kind of um, powerful. And uh, what happened, uh, ironically, I've been growing this baby food empire at that point. Um, this is, Zane comes in 2010, so the pouches were out. We're growing like crazy. I mean, I'm working 18, 19 hour days. I had a C-section and I took Zane to Expo West and worked the booth uh, with him in a carrier three weeks after I had a C-section. Try that. No, actually, don't try that. <laughs> but that's what we do, right? Um, and I was really busy. I, in fact, there was a day um, in April, or sorry, in February 2012, when Target um, came to New York and they gave Happy Baby the Vendor of the Year Award. And that was a really big deal. And um, today, Happy is the largest baby brand in all of Target, even bigger than Gerber, uh, which I'm really proud of. And I was not there that day. And Zane was really sick. And the nanny took him to the doctor. Um, and turned out he got really sick afterwards. We were at the ER the next day with a very high fever. Um, and then within the next couple of months, we started really noticing this lack of engagement and this connection that we had always celebrated. And um, it's actually funny that I'm doing this with you today, Gary um, and Ethan, because I was at your house, Gary. Remember when you first, you had an organic, you had an organic voices summit um, and I came uh, to be a part of it. And I was really concerned because we had just gone to see a developmental pediatrician. And um, it turns out that Zane was diagnosed with autism. And I got that diagnosis, um, I think, if it wasn't the day that I flew to Manchester, it was a few days afterwards, and I was really heavy with that. Um, and if those of you can think about, oh, I've been working on this business for five years, and now everything's so different, and the environment's changed, and my sales are gonna go down 10%, think about what it's like for a moment, without me sounding really high and mighty, to have everything in your world, everything in your world, um which for me was is my my children my son my future all those dreams all those hopes all of those expectations all of those plans everything changed and um i'm not going to pretend that i it didn't take some time i was definitely initially um in denial and I you know I try to go through those phases, but I was very blessed to early on be introduced to a woman named Lisa Ackerman. And Lisa um, is the head of an organization called TACA, which is the Autism Community in Action. And she's created this mentorship program. I mean, almost in a similar way that Gary's done with entrepreneurs, but these are with families who are um, getting autism diagnoses. And they help you through the first 100 days. And you get the ability to have someone who's been in your shoes um, guide you because it's beyond devastating. And what Lisa told me then, and was what I want all of you here today to know, because as much as I love being here with Gary and all of you, I really care about this message. 
when life hits you really hard, if you still have breath left in you, it is not game over, it is game on. And when something you care about is threatened and you are the one, either the leader of your business, the head of your household, the parent that has to be the voice and has to guide, you need to put away that sadness and that mourning and that loss. You need to save it and you need to not act out of fear. You need to act out of hope and optimism, and it's game on. And so, I mean, yes, did we pivot out of frozen baby food into dry and start developing a beautiful, meaningful brand and baby? Yes, did it become successful? Yes, did we start having a little bit of money? Did I, did I stop um, worrying about paying the groceries? Yes, and then boom. I mean, can you, you know, I, I share it, and it's hard for me to share it, I mean, I, it's hard for me to not cry, honestly. Um, but I share it because I need everyone to understand that in my world and in your world, even though right now we are going through something so scary as COVID and the CDC is completely consumed by COVID, as they should be. This is a really scary time. You know, it's a pandemic, a global pandemic. Let me tell you about autism. Autism is an epidemic. Look at 1970, one in 10,000. Two weeks ago, the CDC just released the most recent autism rate in the US and it's a two year, it's based on just an increase in two years. It went from one in 68 uh, to one in 59 to one in 54 in just the last four years. One in 54 is roughly 2% of all the babies born in our country. And I mean, I just showed you that little beautiful baby boy. Um, when before he was the age of two, he could count to 20 in English and Spanish. He showed me the moon. He danced in Jamaica at the airport. Um, he's, he just turned 10 and he started talking in the last two years. And that's because I put everything I can into understanding what are the environmental factors? Um, what can I control? What can't I control? And what can I do from a neuroscience and a neuroplasticity perspective um, to make sure he continues to keep moving forward and can live the, the best life possible? And I don't want this to be about autism, but when you think about our future, um, you know, I, I, I do hope and I'm, I'm certain that COVID will go away, COVID-19 will go away. Maybe one day there will be, you know, the next thing or the next thing. Autism is not gonna go away in two months. Um, and I feel personally very, very committed to being a part of the solution when it comes to autism. So let me tell you what I've learned. All right, um, let's, let's move on to something more positive. So when you have a child with autism, and you grow into a parent of a child with autism, you develop kind of like a PTSD because you never know what to expect. And all you wanna do is figure out like, what's gonna happen, what's next? And one of the things I thought of <laughs> is how can I create a security blanket for myself, almost like an insurance policy, right? Um, it's not like I actually wanted to have another child. Um, she's not here, so she can't hear me, and I don't think she's ever going to listen to this webinar. I wanted, I wanted Zane to have somebody, and I wanted to do everything humanly possible with the brain that I've been given and the access to the resources that I then had after I did sell my company to Danone, which I'm thankful for in many ways, and in many ways I regret, but that's life, um, because I needed to focus on understanding the environmental factors that I could control so that I could create a new life, ensure that Zane had somebody, and, and experience joy, not just for myself as a parent, but to feel secure in knowing that despite what might happen with him once I'm gone, he would have somebody. And I, you know, I have like a, I have a brother who lives in Alabama who 
might have voted for someone we might not all have voted for and um you know he wasn't zane wasn't going to go there i needed to actually like make make a care, caregiver for him and this is asha asha's life asha's name um in swahili means life and the day that my father passed away um i made a pact with my husband that we would have another baby and it would be a girl and her name would be asha because it means life it turns out it also means hope um, and it also means believe in different languages. So she, again, powerful name. Um, we did IVF to have Asha just to ensure we could have a girl. Um, but I also did an immense detox of everything in my surroundings. I looked at every environmental factor from a maternal nutrition standpoint, and I learned things that I didn't know before. I joined the board of the Neurological Health Foundation, which exists simply to protect against neurological disorders in children from a preventative standpoint. I learned that if you are, con are trying to conceive and you take, you're taking folic acid that's bioavailable while you are conceiving, while you conceive, you have a 40% decreased chance of having a child with autism. I learned that everyone talks about how we need more and more iron um, in our lives and that uh, women going into pregnancy should not be anemic. Well, I didn't really understand that iron is like the vehicle that takes oxygen to your brain. So if 10% of women go into pregnancy depleted with iron, and by the third trimester, you're using all this iron to take oxygen to build a human brain, we need to make sure that pregnant women are getting as much iron as they need. I learned so many of these things that I feel, um, you know, I, I was the freak that went to um, the hospital in my third trimester and asked for an iron infusion just because I knew. And I was taking all sorts of vitamins and minerals um, that the head of the Neurological Health Foundation told me to take. And it was literally a counter this big. And while I had a difficult pregnancy, um, this is the the result is this beautiful baby and um the reason why i tell you this story is that now she's three years old she's talking up a storm she's doing great um she is it turns out she's her own human being um and quite quite a feisty one <laughs> but it also turns out that everything i learned is really valuable and when you look at that stat from one to 10,000 to one in 54, if I don't take every ounce of that information and share it with every human being that is considering having a child or being a part of a child's life or bringing one into this world, um, then I'm not doing my duty. And I, honest to God, don't wanna start another company. I, honest to God, am not a serial entrepreneur. I'm tired. I have a kid with autism and a three-year-old. I have to do this. And then guess what happens? We were supposed to launch March 22nd, first day of spring. Um, the company is called Healthy Nest and it's a beautiful business. It's a beautiful brand. Um, and it's meant to share with any new and expecting parent um, all of that information that I wish I had had the first time around that I did have the second time around. And, um, you know, it's meant to teach us all about removing toxins in our life that actually can affect the development of a baby's brain. So our mission is to protect, protect and enrich the full potential of every child. And um, it's also meant to reduce stress because stress is a toxin. So, you know, here's what happens. COVID comes along and, you know, we're in the midst of this launch and I'm taking this very personally. I, I raised the money um, from just a small group of, of um, investors this time who really believed in me and the mission. Um, but I, I do feel very accountable. Um, and I have had a lot of stress because to me, this is my final way of expressing myself in the world. And I want the brand to be perfect and beautiful in every way. And, um, and the question was, here's some of the Here's some of the, the items that we share. Here's our prenatal created trimester by trimester. Um, there's a beautiful, we have cloth diapers. We have plant-based diapers where anything that touches baby skin is made of plants. We have the world's first 100% biodegradable 
um, wipes that are dry, dry wipes and wet wipes made out of organic cotton. Um, the skin care is all pre and probiotic to actually nurture a healthy microbiome of the skin. We have a home cleaning system that reduces, you know, you don't have 100, that if you see on the bottom left of the screen, one concentrate can um, basically, if you use this system, you can replace 100 unnecessary plastic bottles coming in and out of your house. Um, and along with our diapering comes all of these activities and all of these ideas of what you can do to connect with your baby and how you can play with your baby. So COVID comes along and all these parents are stuck at home with their babies and they usually have a nanny and they're like, what should we do with our baby? <laughs> and I'm thinking, we're not ready to launch. We don't even have, we don't even have the photography for the site. So I'm gonna show you guys a couple things and then, I want, then I'm gonna talk about what we've been doing the last month to launch this company. And I, I just want you to see, cause it's, it's funny. I think it looks good, but I wanna show you the behind the scenes. But maybe if you guys agree, we're gonna play this quick video. Um, you guys cool with the video? Yes? Environmental Working Group, welcome to Healthy Nest. Building a healthy nest is really important for how your baby starts their life. The nest begins with the home where the baby and the infant spend all of their time. An environment in which a child feels safe. With unconditional love and support where learning can take place for every member of the family. It's a place where they can be who they want to be. They can explore, they can be silly, they can make mistakes. With lots of diverse and novel stimuli that promote learning in all domains of child development. We want that environment to be as pure and clean as possible. And keeps them safe from environmental chemicals and chemicals of concern. Get back in touch with what feels natural what feels right for us it's important for you to make sure that you've done everything you can in your power to provide them with a safe starting point point. and the more we're in touch with what feels right the better off we are you can do it in your own home your home can become the clean nest that you want it to be an environment that fosters growth and development in the best possible way from our family to yours we are so excited to begin this journey with you and we're here to support you every step of the way. Uh, we launched. And instead of launching on the first day of spring, sorry, um, instead of launching on the first day of spring, it turned out we learned on, uh, we launched on um, World Autism Awareness Day. So maybe it was meant to be that. Um, and ironically, uh, it was March 11th and we, I think the site looks pretty good or I want you guys to go see it, check it out. Please email me if you need something, I, I'm here for you. Um, we wanted, to take all of these beautiful photos. We had the agency set up. I mean, there was, I'm a kind of a visual freak and I really wanted it to be perfect. And the agency um, that was gonna do all of our photography closed their offices. So I just wanna show you behind the scenes how we did that, how we did the launch. And um, I'm gonna maybe show you a couple of pictures of what it looked like around here. And then maybe we'll get to some key takeaways. Um, and then I'll stop talking because I'm so good at just talk, talk, talking, but I won't do it anymore if, um, unless you want me to. So um, luckily, James, who is on my team, uh, his family lives less than a mile away. And we've basically been in the same social cohort. Um, we we took we probably spent 20 hour days for eight or 10 days straight trying to figure out 
how to buy photography equipment, the cameras, the lenses, the lighting. And what I wanted to say is, you no, know, use what you've got. Tap into your creativity um, because I needed to get this launched. It also turns out um, there's a shortage of diapers and wipes and cleaning products. And guess what we have is diapers and wipes and cleaning products. I mean, even this is just an example. This is one of our um, dishcloths. It's, it's a Swedish dishcloth. And um, one of these replaces 17 rolls of, a paper of paper towels. It's made of plants. It, it can absorb half a glass of wine. I know that from experience um, because I drink a lot of wine, being the person that I am. And this is a really cool thing to have around right now when you, um, when you can't find paper towels. And I just felt like, you know, we had to bring this to the world. And so, um, you know, one of the other things that I, I've learned from my experience with Zane personally is that when you are so scared, uh, your brain literally kind of shuts down. And Zane, um, the autistic brain, much of, much of his life is, is kind of ruled by anxiety. And um, there's a saying that says, you know, you can't teach a drowning man how to read. And that is because when you are living in survival mode and it's just fight or flight, it is very challenging to get creative and to think of new things. And we all during this time, and I'm really glad to hear that some of the anxiety is decreasing, but there is still so much of it. And by the way, I'm home with two kids. Um, one with autism who usually has a team of 14 people around him every week and a three-year-old um, and a beautiful husband who is so supportive um, and um, and I am finding ways to not live in fear so that I can use my brain to get us through this and I think that is something really important that we all need to do right now is try not to let the fear override your ability to do something, use what you've got and become creative. And one of the things that I feel really good about is that, and this is just maybe the way I'm wired, but I wake up and I think I'm gonna do something today. I'm gonna make something, I'm gonna help somebody and I am not gonna sit on my ass. And, um, and I feel good at the end of the day if I can say I did something, I helped somebody and I just didn't sit around and watch another episode of The Sopranos you know, which is a great show. Um, so yeah, so James, you wanna show them a little behind the scenes? Real quick, Shazi, cause we, we got a lot of questions. Yeah, I'm gonna stop. I just want you to, this is our, this is our launch party. We, uh, we sent everybody champagne and we launched on Zoom together. This is my team. Um, this is how you launch on Zoom. This is what, um, this is what our little photo studio at home looked like. This is, this is what, this is my off, this is my home office. Um, that's James. That's our photo studio. And like I said, you use what you got. Um, I was able to find almost half a million dollars of organic baby food and about $50,000 of diapers and wipes. And generously, we together with Happy were able to help um, a lot of parents in New York get baby food formula, diapers and wipes. Um, that's Claire on our team doing the handoff. That's my office in Soho, um, where only two people can be at a time working six feet apart from each other. I think you have one picture of a virtual high five, a six foot a distanced high five. And that's, that's what I have for you. Um, that's, that's it. So those are, that's my story. I'm leaving you with these possible words of wisdom. Um, you know, this is not a time to feel sorry for ourselves. It's a time to recognize how much you've been given and use what you've got to make it better. So. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Shazi, for sharing all that with a couple hundred strangers. I'm, I'm sure it, it means a lot right now. Um, and just a reminder to, to anyone, if you have a question for Shazi, there's some already in, but I uh, use the Q&A and not the, the chat function. Um, and we'll get to those in a little bit. I was, I was hoping you could talk a little bit um, in again, understanding our audience is, is mostly early stage entrepreneurs with, with innovative products, uh, either around format or, or health. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the role of, 
science uh, for, for you and how you implement it in business and then also how you take that science and, and actually educate with it. Because I think a problem that a lot of, a lot of early stage companies are running into is they have the evidence or they have the data or they have uh, you know, the initiative, but uh, transmitting that messaging uh, and getting it across to the customer to get them to understand the importance of it. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Ethan, especially because nowadays there are a lot of armchair scientists. And as a mother of a child with autism, I feel like I've somehow gotten my own sort of PhD in um, in treating and understanding this very um, mysterious disorder, yet I'm not an expert. Uh, everyone you saw in our video actually are experts. And um, it's something we've touched on earlier. Like if you have um, new science and something big to bring to the table, you have to find a way to say it with credibility and you have to find the right voices who can speak to it and, um, and show the data um, and be ready to reference the data. And I, I would also add to that is that, it, you know, in today's unique society of, um, you know, very quick sound bites, everything's quick, quick, quick. You got to find a way um, to use visuals and motion graphics um, to convey ideas that might be ch challenging for someone um, to quickly understand. And um, there are so many clever people. And right now, so many great resources, I bet, who... Um, who could help you do this as a, from a creative standpoint. So even for me, like I've, I've wanted to create a video of, you know, a vehicle creating ox, taking oxygen to the brain to quickly tell, tell a mom, like, this is why, you, why iron is that vehicle and you need to invest in the iron. Um, so we have to find ways to explain difficult things. And I think it, it, you have a product that is compelling um, the audience is looking for looking to understand it better and looking for a reason to trust you. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of consumers are overwhelmed by the amount of headlines uh, they're getting, particularly around health and, and what's healthy. And it's confusing with all the different diets. Uh, and, and so I think we, we talked on the pre-call a little bit about using third party validators. Um, would you just touch on, on who you're using for, for healthiness and how you're implementing that? Yeah. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I joined the board of the Neurological Health Foundation, um, and it's, there's a team of 20 world-class scientists that have been studying, you know, just how the brain actually develops um, preconception and in, and in utero, really starting the, the very first moment of, of life. And um, I am not the one who's qualified to discuss how this works. As much as I like to talk about it with my friends, I turn to them to be the spokespeople when it comes to describing a challenging um, concept or um, something that, you know, I need to stay in my lane. And I yeah. think more when we stop, when we get out of our lane and start being the expert of everything, you become less credible. And um, so, yeah, so the other group that we work with very closely is the Environmental Working Group, um, which I know you guys are very familiar with. EWG, for many of you who, who might or might not know, has really been the voice that our country needs um, because our EPA does not do what it needs to do. And EWG is um, really the first de facto organization that's created third party standards for the things that we think have been happening uh, when it comes to regulating our, our, our products. So like for instance, you know, we have prenatals by trimester um, many of you might, might or might not know, but the, um, the supplement industry is not regulated. And when our scientists did the research on 350 studies to develop our prenatal, they also looked at 250 prenatals and they found that 10% of them had heavy metals in the prenatal, but there's no standard to test. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do that. Um, and so I, I really heavily recommend if you have something you believe in, you need to go the distance. You need to find the right people to describe the information in a credible way. And it, and it, and it should not be salesy and marketing like it should be honest and it should be true. And there should be, you know, a number of footnotes because that's, that's what we really need to see when it comes to being science backed. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be bought and paid for. I think if there is something that is rooted in science and evidence, there are people out there with audiences and, and with the 
appropriate expertise that, uh, you know, will go out of their way to, to support brands that are doing the right thing. So, um, so uh, just to shift gears a little bit, kind of going back to the happy days, you talked about um, properly pitching your dream. And I just think that I, I just grabbed onto that because it's, it's obviously highly relevant. Uh, we talked about the HEI pitches coming up. There's a lot of brands on here who are doing that, but it, just in general, uh, most people listening are trying to raise money uh, right now. Could you talk about the development of that? Anything you got wrong on your pitch? Because you knew your dream but uh, how you change that to actually be attractive to, to either investors mm -hmm. or consumers? Yeah, I mean, I've learned a lot because I've heard no a million times and each no should make you stronger and get you to, an, to a yes. Um, but number one, I would pitch as much as you can informally before you do it formally because the questions people throw at you are really become this kind of guidebook of FAQs that you should get very, very astute at being able to answer um, and not sound defensive. And if you can't answer a question in the moment, um, don't be a douchebag, you know? Say, I don't know yet and I will get, right, and I will get back to you and do it professionally. Um, I really, as a, an investor in a number of deals, I really don't like, uh, I mean, it's like an immediate thing that, um, that turns me off is when the entrepreneur knows everything because you know i think i'm one of the smartest people in the world i mean i'm just kidding but i don't know everything i know nothing and when someone pretends that they know everything about everything um then i'm wondering well, why are you raising money for me if you know everything mm -hmm. and so i think that learning to pitch um in your way in your style uh, you need to, I, I think some of the early pitfalls too much hubris too much knowing everything, uh, not and um, but also like again refining the pitch to make sure that you understand your audience and you understand what they're looking for. Are you talking to an impact investor who really wants to understand the SROI of what you're doing? Are you talking to someone who wants to know that in five to seven years I think I'm going to get you an ROI of you know four to nine x and in this scenario it could be this and in this scenario it could be this and that's why it's it's worth risking your capital now. And I think you need to be um, ready to answer difficult questions from a financial perspective, because um, you know, this, uh, I, I think a lot of us who are visionaries and have big ideas and have big dreams also need to find and make sure that you have either the expertise in house or you learn it yourself to get to a place where you're really comfortable being able to have a dialogue about money and returns with investors because i mean in essence that is what they're doing is they're investing in you for a return um ethan shazi i just have to jump in and say what the answer that i just heard and i'm going to just interpret this for everybody listening is practice is you know what you just heard everybody is a very practiced person who got that wisdom from trial and trial and trial and trial and trial. Uh, so, you know, often you only get one shot with the investor and what Shazi just shared with you is something that you can't, you can't get from just listening here. You got to really try it out. Yeah. Well practice in, I mean, there's a level that Shazi just touched on of, of humility. And I think some, somewhere in there you were talking about being ready to adapt. And I think that goes hand in hand with, not knowing everything at the beginning and being mm -hmm. open to, to learning new things about the space. Um, but knowing what you do know and, and being solid in that, and then also being open to feedback, I think uh, is kind of a lesson there. Um, so yeah, when, one thing I did, um, cause I went to business school and at Columbia, they have this competition called, um, it's the, um, uh, well, it's basically an elevator pitch competition, but what they literally do is they film you, in the elevator in Eurus Hall, which is the sort of main uh, building on campus, as you go from the ground floor to, I think whatever the top floor is, it's, but it was literally like, you know, it's literally like an 80 second ride. And I thought that was such a good exercise mm. because um, it's the truth, it is the elevator pitch. And so it might be something fun to do is just video yourself. I mean, back in my day, there was like a dude with a massive video camera, you know, in the elevator. Probably not six um, feet away right now. Yeah. Mm. 
and uh, you know, you like the, the gear and the fur thing. <laughs> but, and uh, I mean, I, I won second in that competition and we did not win first. It was we were crowd, crowd favorite. In fact, um, Tim Sperry, I mimicked Tim Sperry in the elevator pitch competition doing like the Wayne's World do 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 because I pretended I was three or four different sort of characters in the world of natural foods that could enable our success. I think we got to get our hands on this video. Uh, it is so, so embarrassing, maybe one day, but um, like you can play it at my funeral. But um, <laughs> I do think it was a really cool exercise. Videotape yeah. yourself. So um, Zoe just asked a question and I actually had kind of a similar one, so it might be a, a good time to to ask about um, when you transitioned from frozen uh, into pouched baby food, could you just talk a little bit more about that from the perspective of um, a, an innovation that needed to happen in kind of a sleepy category, but how do you actually implement that at retail? I mean, you had, I think, obviously what turned out to be a solution uh, in terms of format and you knew that, but then how did, how did you and maybe some other uh, brands in that space uh, actually achieve that? Yeah, so I mean, the R&D to probably launch a pouch is what at the time I would say would be like at least 12 months. Um, so a few brands came out within a short period of time around mm -hmm. the same time, um, but we'd all been sort of probably behind the scenes and working on this. And the thing about new technology is that before so the technology, it became readily apparent that this was going to be this big thing. But then the pipeline to create that t the technology is kind of a it's it was um, it, it was it, it was complicated in the sense that there were only three facilities in the country that had the line to do pouching, mm -hmm. and if you wanted uh, line time because they were so so over you know there was zero line time you had to get the money to prepay for line time, and. Um, because of the sort of monopoly at the time with the pouch technology, the packaging of the pouch itself was made by the same company. So think Tetra Pak. So you have to go um, get um, pre-buy the, the, the cylinders and each cylinder, every color on a pouch, $10,000 for one hmm. cylinder of color. Um, it's really different nowadays. And so we a ton didn't have of investment up front. Yeah, we had ton of ton of investment up front, like a bank, uh, like an investment bank, um, really. And we, but it was, and and I have to say, I'm usually someone who follows my gut. And if I see something and I feel like it's going to be right, I kind of follow my gut. But the numbers in this case did not lie. And within the first two weeks of our pouches being rolled out at Target, we were the first pouches at Target and at Whole Foods. Within the first two weeks, the, um, we had, I think, number two, four, and five best-selling items in the entire baby set. Whoa. And if you don't look at that and then immediately respond and batten down the hatches and figure out how to get the money you need to um, stay in the game, then you're wasting a breath. Um, and so that was, that was like kind of what I did and something recently like that happened to me where we were, we were thinking about delaying the launch of Healthy Nest and we have these diapers, um, which I mean, really are like the softest, uh, most amazing diapers and everything's made of plants and they're non-toxic in every way, third party tested, I mean, food grade quality. And I'm thinking I need to delay the launch of the company. And Joe sends me a picture from Whole Foods and everything, and this is in early March, everything in Whole Foods was totally in stock, mm. totally in stock. And then there's a sign, and I, I have it somewhere. Um, James, where you can help me find it. But there was a sign, and Joe takes a picture, and he shows it to me. And I'm like, if you don't, if, if you expect God to give you a different, like, a, like a tap on the shoulder and come visit you in a dream, you're crazy. Because this is, the, the sign said, Due to high demand and something, something to support all of our customers, we're limiting the quantities to the, of the following items. And the sign says baby diapers, baby wipes, baby formula, toilet paper, paper towels, which I showed you we have, and you know, disinfecting and antibacterial sprays, which we have. All of your liquid, products. Liquid bleach, we do not have. And I mean, what are you gonna do? 
So the first thing I did is I called our wife's manufacturer. I said, I'm prepaying you 100% with all the cash. We have cash. I'm prepaying you for line time. I called our diapers manufacturer. It's in Europe. We, um, we went ahead and moved forward on the second order. And everything that we had in storage in Europe we, it, that was supposed to be on a, um, on a ship to save with freight, Air. it's on a plane. And it was one of the last flights that left Europe. So we're in stock so that we can service people who have babies that need diapers. Mm. And that's like what, what, what we have to be doing, you know? Um, and that was the same way it was with the pouches. It was like every minute counted. If you didn't pick up the phone and call your friend who owned the facility that you've now become, you know, had a relationship with and get yourself in line for production, you are wasting your time, you know? So do or your, so do your yeah. again, summary, do your homework, but act. I mean, the power of action versus thinking is, that's where it's all at, right? Yeah, and well, so, so Shazi, you also launched, um, this is online. So could you, um, you know, again, just with the, with the audience in mind, could you just talk about that maybe for, for companies that were planning on, for the early stage products that maybe see a time that they could execute right now, but not at retail? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, this is a great time to develop an e-commerce strategy if you haven't yet had one. Um, there are so many tutorials and tools. Shopify is a really easy platform to use. I mean, I think my mother could create a website and sell something on it. I mean, I'm not kidding. And she's, you know, um, I'm surprised if she hasn't, because she's quite entrepreneurial herself. But I, but this, you know, we have to adapt. And um, I think that there are a lot of businesses, the ones that I'm invested in or um, or on the board of and help to advise. I've seen that if you if you are able to show to a consumer that you have something essential that they need or something that they want, I mean, it could even be a luxury item. Um, and if you are able to communicate to them and find a way to reach them, and this is where you have to tap into your creativity to, to make sure that you somehow land in their inbox or, um, you know, maybe you start focusing some of your promotional dollars to Google AdWords and maybe you get really creative uh, with the Google AdWords that you purchase. Because, um, you know, I'm not going to go out and buy the Google AdWords for um, diapers because that's just a waste of money. Yeah. Um, because all the big guys are going to spend $2 to get all the clicks on the first 10 pages. Mm -hmm. But what about um, trying to conceive postpartum depression? What about, um, you know, I don't know, uh, non-toxic cloth diapers? There are so many things that, um, that you know, you, you can adapt and shift. And I would say um, get creative and don't be, don't be nervous about new channels. They can actually bring you um, a better margin and potentially create a stronger business. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And thinking about timing right now, too, obviously, it's very dependent on the products. But there's a reason that, uh, you know, again, mostly food foodies on here, there's a reason that grocery and supplements are, are deemed essential right now. And, and that doesn't mean because it has to be an immunity product to be successful right now. There's a lot of different, um, I think, definitions of, of what's essential to people around uh, this time and around health and wellness in general. So, so find, find the angle, I think, is the takeaway on that. Um, so we had, yeah. Um, so we have a few more minutes, uh, just kind of, um, I guess broad strokes here. Well, actually, um, this is kind of going further back in time. Uh, we have a question. Can you speak through adversity that you faced raising money with your first venture and how you overcame it? Yes. Um, so I probably spent the first five or six years as the founder and CEO of Happy Raising um, Money, maybe I would say 50 to 60% of my time was spent raising money. Um, the adversity was being an unproven entrepreneur, not having a track record back then, possibly some um, discrimination, who knows? I mean, I think I'm, you know, amazing and I don't feel, uh, I don't feel somehow disadvantaged, but um, being an immigrant woman um, for some might have been a challenge um, or, or might, might have looked like a challenge for me. I never let that get in the way. 
Um, but I think, you know, learning how to hone the networks that, um, that I could access and um, like just being really persistent and you have to develop a really thick skin. And as I said before, um, the, I overcame adversity by just not quitting. It was, I didn't overcome anything. I just, and then by the time you hit half of the amount you're raising, this beautiful thing called momentum kicks in. And then if you're a salesperson, which you need to become, because that's what raising money is, is, is the art of selling. You need to start using that momentum and letting people know that, hey, we've had this conversation. I'm, I'm half committed. Uh, within two weeks, I expect to be fully committed. You know, are you in or are you in? And you need to create a sense of urgency um, for yourself around a timeline because that, that is one of the things that helped me the most is just um, really like learning that fundraising is an art. It's an art of selling um, and that you, and the adversity, it's almost like being an actor going on a million auditions and you're not right for the role, you're not right for the role. Sometimes you might be targeting the wrong role. That's the wrong type of investor, it's the wrong, you know, and you learn and you sort of fine tune um, where you're having success and where you're not. But part of it is just to keep going until you get what you need. Yeah, um, can I just quickly interject a memory here. Uh, Shazi, we had mentioned that we had a partnership uh, with her at Stonyfield, very modest. Uh, Shazi came to us for a loan for an advance. And uh, I can tell you, my CFO looked at me in horror, said, who is this woman? We can't do this. And I, I overruled her and we did this because of Shazi, because of you. Uh, it, 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 you know, it wasn't the numbers. It wasn't the balance sheet. It wasn't, it was your boldness and your belief in yourself and uh, your compelling case. So uh, anybody listening here, uh, don't sell yourself short. Well, yeah, I so. think you're, you you were the one who told me something that I tell other people and pretend it's mine, but it's yours. And that if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> no, and I don't, Ethan has never heard that except for 12 times a day. It's also been on every every webinar so far. <laughs> so if uh, okay. the repeat listeners are getting it hammered home. Well, I've, I've co-opted it. Uh, we got about three minutes. Uh, see if there's a couple last questions, Eve. Um, yeah, I think, uh, no, I think we're all set, I guess, uh, persistence and don't be a douchebag were my two big takeaways, but, uh, any, anything you want to wrap up with? Um, no, I just, I wish you, you guys all the best. Um, if anyone really has anything that's more specific that they'd like to know, I'm, I'm here. Um, and you know, I hope that you all can um can make the most of this time and find some silver linings and i hope we all stay safe and i'm excited to have been a part of this gary it's really enjoyable to be with you i miss you and um ethan it's so nice to see you and um and you know i i believe we're all i'm guessing everybody listening in and anybody who uh, participates has a really big great heart and deserves a lot of success and i i believe that you have every opportunity to go get it and I, and I wish you all the best. Well, that's very dear. Let me, uh, Shazi, what I do each of these is I sort of resummarize the, the key takeaways. And let me also just, since you were explaining your kids' names, say that Ethan's name means firm. And uh, thank you, Ethan, for a nice firm job of, uh, at, at the tiller today. Uh, Shazi, uh, these are the key takeaways that I got. Uh, meet the needs of the consumer where they are. Uh, go to them. Don't just be supply-sided. Uh, if it isn't working, pivot, cut your losses, and try it again. Frozen cubes, you know, just move on. Uh, when I love this one. When life hits you really hard, if you still have breath, it's not game over, it's game on. That's a great, that's a, such a great, and it's in your uh, video. You guys, if you go to her home site, see that. Uh, act out of hope, not fear. Love that. Right now, such an important time. Uh, you didn't say this, but you said it in a million ways. Science matters. You know, we heard this from Seth yesterday. Ethan, you just echoed it. You know, look, uh, it, we're in a fact-free zone in the White House right now. We're in a fact-free zone in much of our government. Uh, but you want to build a strong brand. You want to be a real solution. Science matters. Do your homework. Don't promise something you can't deliver. And uh, be sure you've got your facts straight before you go out there. Use what you've got, which in your case, as you said, is a lot of creativity. I loved uh, make a plan to accomplish something every day. That's such a, I mean, that's all we got, right? We got today. So make a plan, get something done today. Uh, don't live in fear. 
uh, know your lane and know what you don't know. And I think that's a really terribly important lesson. Uh, each no should make you stronger and get you to a yes. Well, I, I said, you know, I described you as tenacious at the beginning. And if that's a, a mo if that isn't your motto, I don't know what is. So uh, uh, a no is not a no. A no is a, a speed bump on the way to a eventual yes. Uh, when pitching, know your audience. It is selling. Uh, so get your homework done right. Go for it. The go for it part of this comes through loud and clear. But, uh, but know your audience, speak to your audience, go to where your audience is. And uh, finally, the, the, the hint on Shopify, I think it is a great way to, uh, for people to start. So I really appreciate it. Not sure if uh, I missed any keys, but those are, the, those are the ones that jump at me. You did it um, so much better than I did, Gary. I mean, why yeah. am I even here? But thank you. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting some practice. Uh, folks, listen, uh, thank you for yet another absolutely amazing webinar uh, and for joining us. Uh, just to remind you again, uh, next week uh, we have uh, a couple uh, coming up. Andrew Abraham, the founder uh, and CEO of Orgain, uh, will be with us on Tuesday. Drake Sadler, the co-founder of Traditional Medicinals. And Drake wants to take us on an interesting ride. He wants to talk about the future of Traditional Medicinals. Uh, and uh, bringing uh, alternative uh, medicine, medical solutions to the marketplace. So it's going to be a very interactive one. And then uh, if you look a little bit ahead, we have my old friend Myra Goodman, who helped uh, er start Earthbound Farms. We added this conversation on the 29th, you don't want to miss, with Kehi in for an NCG. And then uh, the wonderful Sonal Shah uh, will uh, wind up this series. But I will tell you that we, from your popular demand, we are launching. Um, uh, we are launching um, uh, a bunch of May symposia also. Again, I want to remind you, we have the Entrepreneurship Institute, May 7th and 8th. So uh, here it is. Uh, you can go to hirschberginstitute.com. Uh, uh, please, if you have any thoughts about, uh, if Shazi has inspired you to uh, make a fi fundraising pitch, you know, like you don't ask, you don't get, this is your moment, but you got to get it in this week. You got to get it in right away. Sh uh, Carlene would probably say you got to get it in tonight, but I, you know, we'll give you till tomorrow. But get them in because we've got to do a. The jury has to do a lot of screening, and we we, we need to make our call by uh, at the end of the day tomorrow or or Friday. Um, that is it uh, for us today, uh, Shazi. Once again, a million thanks, and uh, obviously we all wish you the best. You 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 have a beautiful uh, brand. It comes from the heart, uh, and and uh, I. I really, I don't think anybody would ever dare to bet against you. I certainly would not. And uh, Mr. Firm, Ethan, thank you again. Julie, Carlene, thank you. Go with that nickname. Okay. All right. Bye, guys. Stay All strong. Right. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.